Hey all, welcome to Eric Rates Games, the channel that provides the most in-depth game reviews. There are a number of timestamps in the video below, so please feel free to jump around. Today, we'll be taking a look at The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, the third installment of The Witcher trilogy based on a collection of short stories and novels by Polish author Andrzej Sapkowski. This multi-platform game has sold more than 40 million copies and is among the top 15 selling games of all time. The Witcher 3 is classified as an action RPG and was released by CD Projekt in May 2015. It has received top reviews from critics and fans alike and is among the contenders for greatest game of all time. Some of the key strengths include a compelling narrative, a unique approach to branching dialogue, an immersive world, unapologetically mature themes, and a trove of storyline and side quests guaranteed to keep even the speediest players busy for dozens of hours. The immersive world, compelling story, and a plethora of intriguing quests and activities are a few of the game's claims to fame. So without further delay, let's look at what made the story so exceptional. As mentioned, The Witcher 3 story and world are based on books. This combined with two prequels means some background is in order. To start, a critical event in the world where The Witcher 3 takes place is something called the Conjunction of Spheres. This event resulted in species from formerly separate worlds combining into the current one. Interestingly, the Conjunction not only heralded a variety of dangerous monsters, but humans themselves arrived during the same phenomenon. Thus, the races that previously occupied the world, including dwarves, gnomes, and elves, are referred to as elder races. In the years since the conjunction, human influence and dominance has slowly spread. Thus, there is often general resentment toward humans from elder races, amplified by certain cities and rulers' racist policies. Another class of humans critical to the story are witchers. Witchers are biologically enhanced humans created by taking young children, training them extensively in combat, and subjecting them to a series of often deadly chemical treatments known as the Trial of Grasses. Only three in ten Witcher children survive the trial, the rest dying in agony. Those who do survive enhance their speed, strength, reflexes, vision, metabolism, and tolerances to additional poisons that can further elevate their fighting prowess. Most witchers are either orphan children with no home to speak of, or are children acquired as repayment through rituals tied to fate. The most famous method is called the Law of Surprise. For example, if a witcher saves a man's life, he may request something a man possesses but knows not of yet. If the man returns home to find his wife is with child, then fate and the Law of Surprise would decree that the child join the witcher ranks. The original purpose for creating witchers was to help hunt and slay dangerous monsters that entered the world during the conjunction. However, after monsters were mostly driven from big cities and towns, a mob of peasants manipulated by opportunistic mages stormed their keep and murdered most of the witchers who were seen as unnatural. For this reason, few witchers now remain. Sorcerers and sorceresses are the next key group. These magic wielders are typically human or elven in race, and represent a small yet powerful segment of the overall population. They use magic to sow destruction, alter their appearance, slow their aging, and historically, powerful mages have held high positions as advisors to northern kings and queens. The last significant faction is a group of dangerous and magically adept beings referred to as the Wild Hunt. They invade this world from another to murder, pillage, and capture members to join their ranks, leaving only an icy path of destruction in their wake. Another area of the game that isn't well explained is the geopolitical landscape that pits a strong invading southern empire known as Nilfgaard against a fractious collection of northern kingdoms that once included Sintra, Adirn, Cerwyn, Temeria, and Redania. Nilfgaard has invaded in the past and captured the southernmost kingdom of Sintra. In the current game, Nilfgaard is embarking on another invasion and has managed to conquer Edirne, Cedwin, and most recently Temeria. 
The sorceress's lodge has been scattered, leaving only the kingdom of Redania to face a depleted Nilfgaardian foe. There are also neutral territories, including the free city Novigrad, Kovis and Pover to the north, and the island nation to the west known as Skellige. In The Witcher 3, you play primarily as Geralt of Rivia, a witcher of great renown who consorts with sorceresses and is involved with matters of state far beyond his station. At the core of Geralt's priorities is to ensure the safety of his ward Ciri, who Geralt views as a daughter. In the books, Ciri was originally promised to Geralt through the Law of Surprise. Geralt had just lifted a curse from her unknowing father, Dunny, and with no desire to receive a reward, invoked the Law of Surprise as an afterthought. To everyone's surprise, Ciri's mother and the Princess of Sintra revealed that she was with child. Geralt had no desire to enforce his claim, and thus years later, when returning to collect the child, happily left empty-handed. However, a series of events, including a shipwreck that killed Ciri's parents, Ciri getting lost in an enchanted forest, and ultimately Ciri fleeing capture when the Nilfgaardians conquered Sintra, left Geralt continually crossing paths with the young girl. Ultimately, Geralt agreed to accept Ciri as his ward and trained her at the Witcher home Kaer Morhen. However, it was soon uncovered that Ciri was no ordinary child. Through many trials and tribulations, and leveraging help from the sorceresses Triss and Yennefer, it is discovered that Ciri is a descendant of a powerful elven mage who fell in love with a human sorcerer. Her unique brand of magic is both powerful and uniquely suited to traversing space and time. It is this ability that has allowed Ciri to escape danger in the past, and a number of powerful forces now seek Ciri for their own personal gain. Geralt's first mission is to track down Yennefer, who Geralt has had a long and sordid past with, including a series of romantic trysts. Interestingly, both witchers and sorceresses are sterile, and like Geralt, Yennefer came to see Ciri as her own daughter while training her in magic before her disappearance. Thus, the game centers around Geralt navigating his own personal relationships, the complex geopolitical landscape, and the powerful forces that seek to control Ciri. While I won't talk in much detail about the specific plot points of the game, the story in The Witcher is outstanding. This stems from five main factors that I'll cover now. Number one. There is rich and dense source material. This is the benefit of having a game based on novels. While the game doesn't do the best job of explaining everything, and people unfamiliar with the books and new to the games will likely get confused at certain points, there is enough good plot and intrigue that missing a reference here or there won't ruin the action. Number two, the world is captivating. The unique mix of monsters, magic, different races, and geopolitical strife make every aspect of where you go and what you do feel important and interesting. Number three, the game has a unique and in-depth approach to branch dialogue and outcomes. Not only are players routinely given two or more response options to add flavor, but at numerous junctures of the game, the decisions you make have long-lasting implications. This groundbreaking approach to storytelling culminates in 36 unique, albeit sometimes similar, endings. Number four, the dialogue is sharp and clever. Brave warrior looks like. Got two swords, see? Oi, great boy. What's the point of having two swords? Wonder if he keeps an extra prick in his trousers too. Many characters don't like you and make this abundantly clear. You refuse to go. Mm -hmm. Fuck you! Moreover, the dialogue and corresponding actions are unfiltered and horrific when warranted. One clear example of this is when Geralt is quarreling with three witches known as the Crones. These characters are brilliantly designed to appear repulsive in every way, and in a last mocking gesture, the Weavis uses a pair of small legs sewn onto her hip to perversely gesticulate to Geralt in a suggestive manner. Everything about the scene and the act was appalling, and when reflecting on who the crones are and what they represent, the action fit perfectly with their characters and accomplished exactly what it intended. It made me hate them and want to kill them. Number five, 
Last, and in my opinion most importantly, the game represents a war-torn medieval countryside as is, and doesn't pull any punches. There's lying, theft, murder, subterfuge, rape, torture, orphan children, and many innocent people meet horrific ends. And honestly, it's damn refreshing. Don't get me wrong, some of the stories are horrifying, like the young noblewoman who takes a potion to feign death from would-be rapists, only to awaken paralyzed while dozens of rats eat her alive. But the real world, particularly the one back then, was horrifying, and the authentic portrayal of the world where such evil exists is incredibly compelling, as it makes you want to prevent that evil from unfolding. Furthermore, there is no moralizing. If you forego collecting on a contract to help an orphan child, you are not instantly rewarded in some other way. You just have less money. If you decide to ignore someone being accosted in the street, you aren't instantly punished. The innocent person simply suffers from your apathy. There are also very few filters when it comes to adult material. Gore is commonplace and even featured in certain kill animations Geralt executes against susceptible enemies. Sex also features prominently, with Geralt able to pursue a series of romances with key characters as well as visit multiple brothels in Novigrad. These pursuits lead to gracious and infamous cutscenes. Another interesting element that comes with this refreshing level of freedom and realism is that making the moral choice isn't always so easy. For example, in one of the earliest side quests of the game, you are given the chance to help a dwarven blacksmith catch an arsonist. Once uncovered, the man offers to bribe you for your silence. You may think that by refusing his bribe, you're doing what's righteous but when he's summarily hanged without a trial by Nilfgaardians, you suddenly aren't so sure. To summarize, the story in The Witcher 3 has a good plot, but what really makes it special are the combination of atmosphere, dialogue, freedom, and dark realism. Like most open world titles, the game flow in Witcher 3 works nicely. This is because players are free to embark on the main storyline, side quests, or just explore the vast and open world. There is a nice balance between objectives explicitly indicated on the map and sites of interest that must be uncovered either through proximity, notices on public boards, or interacting with NPCs who are relevant to the quest. To help expedite the playthrough, a trusty steed, Roach, can be summoned outside of cities and a series of town markers and harbors serve as fast travel points. There is also a mini-map that will help guide and direct players to the next marked area. Pro tip! White dots on the mini-map will appear to help circumvent obstacles that may stand between Geralt and his marked quest. I will say that it felt unnecessary and at times mildly irritating that Geralt must be standing adjacent to one of the fast travel markers to use the fast travel menu, and I think enabling fast travel from anywhere would be an improvement in the future. Also, if players can only fast travel from specific points, a unique indicator should exist on the minimap that guides players to the nearest fast travel point. I found myself constantly opening up the map and using my custom icon to denote the nearest fast travel point. Having this feature automated seems far more sensible. Shifting focus to the content of the game, it is quite impressive. There are almost 300 unique quests with numerous interesting themes among them. Pro tip, complete horse racing quests ASAP to unlock equipment for Roach that makes playing the game more efficient. Pro tip two, most items in The Witcher are weightless or nearly weightless, however, Animal hides, armor, and saddles are exceptions to this and should be sold to merchants to avoid becoming over-encumbered. Some of the side quest categories include Witcher Contracts, where you face off against challenging monsters for coin, Treasure Quests, where you find rare diagrams for crafting impressive weapons and armor, Horse Racing, to unlock improved equipment for Roach, Fist Fighting, which pits you against champions from across various regions, and perhaps the most impressive thematic side quest line of all, Gwent. Gwent is a simple, yet deceptively strategic card game that was so well designed and popular, it had its own successful standalone title. In every region, Geralt can challenge renowned Gwent players to win their signature cards. 
Many common characters like blacksmiths play Gwent and will offer you a card for your first victory. Some bartenders will also sell Gwent cards along with their typical food and drink. While these cards are typically not very good, on occasion certain barkeeps and NPCs offer surprisingly rare and powerful additions. The Gwent story arc culminates in a high-stakes tournament that sets you against four advanced competitors with a considerable cash prize at stake. While luck plays a small factor in drawing the best opening hand, strategy plays a far greater role in victory, and I had a great time improving and tweaking my deck for optimal play. In fact, I had so much fun that I made a separate video here explaining the game and some key tips and strategies for every faction. There are numerous quests that fall outside of the generic categories itemized above, but all typically have a unique bit of flair that make them more interesting than basic fetch quests commonly featured in similar games. In terms of exploration, the size and scope of the world is vast and littered with sites of interest to explore. When you've had your fill of side quests and exploration, the main story tells an interesting, if sometimes hard to follow narrative, that excels in witty dialogue and development of unique and interesting characters. To summarize, there are countless ways for players to interact with and enjoy the game, and regardless of the adventures chosen, all elements of the game are good enough to provide a seamless and satisfactory user experience. The combat system in The Witcher 3 is decent, but inferior to the story and game flow. It has some nice features, including a challenging foundation where enemy attacks deal heavy damage, and precise and repetitive dodges are required for successful play. It also incorporates a secondary dodge that goes farther and is better for certain enemy attacks. Apart from dodging, players must be measured with how they attack. Enemies typically only remain vulnerable for limited periods of time and will counterattack if overly pressed. Also worth noting are the uses of quick and heavy attacks. Typically players will strike with short combos of quick attacks, but when properly timed or facing enemies that are stunned, a devastating heavy attack may be the optimal choice. Apart from the core mechanics of dodging and swordplay, the next useful option are signs. Signs are basic magic spells that witchers are able to cast and include Yurden, creates a circle of dots that slow enemies that enter, causes them to take increased damage, and can apply other status effects. Can also close portals opened by the Wild Hunt. Quen creates a timed protective barrier around Geralt. This sign typically absorbs most of the damage from any singular strike, and against lower level enemies can persist through multiple hits. Igni causes a small cone of flame to erupt from Geralt's hand. This spell deals fire damage, can hit multiple enemies, and can inflict the burning status. Can also be used to light torches and candles out of combat. Axi stuns a singular target, leaving them susceptible to punishing attacks. Can also be used to calm Roach or influence singular NPCs' actions out of combat. Ard releases a wave of energy that can hit multiple enemies and knock them over. can also be used to break open certain doors or rubble to expose secret passageways outside of combat. These magic spells require Geralt's stamina bar to be full and drain all available stamina when utilized. This means that other stamina requiring actions like running or large dodges cannot be performed immediately preceding sign casts. Geralt must recuperate stamina between sign uses. Certain monsters are weak to various signs, and thus experienced players will often switch between signs most applicable to the given situation. Properly leveraging signs whenever Geralt's stamina fills is a critical resource for maximizing combat efficacy. Pro tip, your stamina regenerates 10 times faster outside of combat, so cast a shield and let your stamina replenish before entering combat when possible. The next main branch of combat is the use of decoctions or potions to increase Geralt's combat effectiveness. There are a wide variety of potions and decoctions that recipes and ingredients must be found to craft.
However, once crafted, potions and decoctions can easily be replenished simply by meditating and consuming commonly found alcohols. Drinking potions increases Geralt's toxicity, and if raised too high, will cause Geralt to lose life until the toxicity slowly decreases. Geralt also has a maximum toxicity level that once reached will prevent future potion consumption. The default max toxicity is 100, but can be increased well over 250 with certain skill point investments. Potions are typically lower in toxicity and apply short-term effects like increasing the rate of stamina regeneration, increasing adrenaline point gain, causing additional damage, and much more. Certain potions are designed for use out of battle and have effects like increasing the time you can stay underwater and improving your vision in darkness. Decoctions are higher toxicity potions that apply long-term effects. To make decoctions, you must defeat monsters that give you the necessary mutagen. A number of decoctions can be created with a wide variety of effects but it is typically best to focus on using one or two that best complement a given build. For example, if using a sign-focused build, decoctions that pair well with stamina recovery and effects are a good option. The final important attribute is adrenaline. This resource is slowly accrued by successfully executing attacks and is reduced when taking damage. This mechanic rewards skilled play and is especially important when fighting difficult enemies with sizable health pools. Apart from the combat attributes, there are also supplementary items. These include the crossbow, which is useful for knocking flying enemies out of the sky, an assortment of bombs that do considerable damage to susceptible enemies, and oils that increase your sword damage against corresponding classes of monsters. There are an infinite number of basic bolts, and improved ones can be found as the game progresses. Like potions, bombs require recipes and ingredients to craft, but once created, replenish automatically when meditating and consuming alcohol. Oils also require recipes and ingredients, but can be infinitely applied after crafting. Pro tip, throw bombs into the ground by monster's feet. Otherwise, they can sail past the target. To summarize, Combat is challenging and complex due to the multiple elements required to optimize performance. Where it falters slightly is in the graphics and animation of the combat actions. The jerky, abrupt motions can feel a bit random and hard to predict, and while this is mostly related to the age of the game, it feels a little subpar even when compared to its peers. The large number of required actions for effective combat can also feel like a bit of a chore as each big battle is preceded by applying the correct oil, taking the right mix of potions, and pre-applying a shield. Players that use signs will find themselves constantly using the shortcut menu to switch back and forth between the necessary signs, which can also disrupt the flow of battle. This also happens when needing to swap bombs or equip a crossbow. The heavy focus on dodging, relatively high damage that both Geralt and enemies do, and the limited windows of enemy vulnerability remind me a little bit of Elden Ring, but with 0% of the polish, variety, and mind-blowing visuals. All of this left me feeling content, but not overly impressed with combat in The Witcher 3. Like many aspects of The Witcher 3, the leveling system is a bit complex and not clearly explained. The most direct form of leveling is collecting attribute points by either leveling up or locating a place of power, typically hidden in difficult to access areas on the world map. These attribute points can be spent in one of four skill trees. Red, pertaining to attack power and generic combat, passively increases adrenaline point gain. Blue, pertaining to sign power and intensity, passively increases stamina regen. Green, pertaining to potions, bombs, and oils, passively increases potion duration time. Brown, a general skill tree that has powerful effects that aren't upgradable and don't come with passive bonuses. There are a number of complicating factors associated with these skills. The first and most important is that there are limited skill slots. 
Players start the game with only one available skill slot. This means that you cannot upgrade two distinct skills and equip them both. While new slots unlock every two levels at the beginning of the game, there are only a total of 12 unlockable slots. Compare this to the 30 to 50 ability points a player might unlock during a given playthrough, and you have to be very strategic with selecting skills to ensure you don't invest points in abilities that you'll be unable to equip. This most directly limits the number of non-upgradable brown skills you can unlock and equip. For this reason, it is best to only upgrade zero to two skills from the brown tree. A secondary advantage to the red, blue, and green trees are mutagens that give bonuses for skills of the matching color. Mutagens drop from defeating monsters. Generic mutagens can be combined via alchemy to transform three lower level mutagens to a higher level. The level starts at lesser, upgrades to normal, and caps out at greater. Mutagens assigned to groups of skills that match their color provide a buff. For example, a greater red mutagen slotted in a grouping with a red skill will provide a 20% increase in attack damage. For each other red skill in the grouping, this bonus is increased 10% to a maximum of 40%. Thus, it is of great importance to both A, find and upgrade mutagens corresponding to the selected skills, and b, ensure they're strategically equipped to take full advantage of the buffs. The last consideration with spending attribute points is that a minimum number of points are required to access the next tier of skills. This, combined with the limited skill slots, mean that players must either limit their focus to one or two colors, or meticulously plan. I personally decided to pursue skills in all color branches. Because I had such a diverse skill tree, I had to invest points in a skill I couldn't equip. The next key form of leveling involves acquiring improved weapons and armor. Certain strong weapons and armor have high minimum level requirements. Apart from the required level, the next most important aspect of gear is the rarity. Equipment has five distinct classifications. Number one, common, uncolored, the worst equipment. Number two, magic, blue colored, can have an enchantment and rune slot. Number three, rare, yellow colored, the next level of rarity with improved stats, enchantments, and rune slots. Number four, relic, orange colored, the highest level of rarity with powerful unique enchantments, more rune slots, and the best stats. Number five, witcher gear, green colored, typically on par with relic level equipment, but can be upgraded. There are four witcher gear types, including school of the viper, griffin, cat, and ursine. I would recommend slowly improving gear early from areas of interest and defeating monsters until relic diagrams become available. Picking up supplies as the game progresses should enable players to craft the occasional item at blacksmiths. Players can also choose to embark on treasure hunt quests to find Witcher gear diagrams, which should suffice for a majority of the game. The final form of leveling involves acquiring recipes for improved potions, bombs, and advanced decoctions. Acquiring rare materials from the wild or alchemists allows Geralt to craft upgraded versions of these, and as bigger and rare enemies are defeated, new and more powerful decoctions become available. There are a lot of menus in The Witcher 3. The in-game menu has seven sub-menus for glossary, alchemy, inventory, world map, quests, character, and meditation. The glossary has submenus for monsters you encounter and their weaknesses, tutorials, information about the game characters, a separate menu for the books you've collected, and a list of all craftable equipment. While the first three menus are pretty handy, I'd say the last two probably aren't necessary. The alchemy tab is where you craft potions, bombs, decoctions, and oils. Players should regularly check this menu as they progress and collect unique ingredients to make sure these items are at the highest possible level. 
Next is the Inventory tab. It shows your currently equipped weapons, armor, potions, food, bombs, and special items. It also shows Roach's gear and your current life total and toxicity. To the left are a series of submenus that organize your inventory into categories. To equip something new, you must locate it on the left submenu and drop it into the right equip slot. After inventory is the world map which you'll use frequently to orient yourself and place custom markers. The quests are organized in their own tab and are broken into main, secondary, witcher contracts, and treasure hunts. Second to last is the character menu, where you'll put attribute points into various skills and add them to skill slots. Finally is the meditation menu. This menu can be used to pass time or to replenish health and supplementary items. Note that on hard difficulty, life will not refill for meditation and must be gained by consuming food or alternative methods. While the menus impart a lot of information and ultimately fulfill their tasks, I think there were a number of areas to improve. These include, one, having the menu immediately open to the world map. This is by far the most common reason to open your menu and having to click an additional time to enter the map is unnecessary especially since the game lets you toggle quickly between menus with R1 and L1. 2. When selecting items already equipped, that item is simply removed rather than having the option to replace it. 3. Every time you pick up an item, even if you've picked it up 100 times before, the inventory tab will have a yellow mark indicating that there are unreviewed items. In other games, this only happens when picking up something for the very first time. Having the yellow mark show up with every incremental item triggered my OCD, and I found myself constantly scrolling through the inventory to remove the mark. 4. Kind of inexplicably, there is no way to abandon a quest once you've accepted it, which can lead to clutter. 5. Most games prioritize featuring character status. This includes current attack damage, sign intensity, armor level, and lets you compare and contrast those stats while selecting a new skill or equipping different gear. In The Witcher, the only way to access this menu is to hold R2 while in the inventory submenu. This is both oddly tucked away and unintegrated with any of the skill and equipment selection menus. 6. There is too much to look at. An example would be when trying to find the right decoction or potion to drink during a battle. By the end of my playthrough, I had 34 unique potions and decoctions to select from maybe eight of which I would ever realistically consider using. There isn't a good option for sorting these into useful versus non-useful sections. The only remedy is to drop or permanently destroy these items, which feels like an overly severe solution as players may not know whether the item or potion will be uniquely suited to a specific circumstance. This overload can also be experienced during alchemy and armor crafting. The settings menu is pretty basic and is primarily used to save, load, and quit to the main menu. Kind of oddly, access to the Gwent deck is also stored in the settings menu, even though it feels more accurately categorized as an in-game menu. For all the above reasons, I think the menus in The Witcher 3 were average at best, and it is an area the franchise could improve in the future. For controls, the left joystick dictates movement while the right joystick regulates vision. L3 can be pressed twice to call Roach to your side, and R3 toggles between objectives and quests that contain more than one task. The touchpad opens the in-game menu while the options button opens the settings menu. For the D-pad, up and down D-pad use consumable items equipped to those slots. Holding down up and down D-pad will toggle between the primary and secondary equipped item. Left and right D-pad manually trigger Geralt to draw or sheath his steel and silver swords. R2 casts the currently equipped sign, and holding L2 triggers Geralt's Witcher senses. In combat, L2 also blocks, or when pressed just before certain attacks, will cause Geralt to parry. Pro tip, under Options, Gameplay, I recommend turning on the Turn Off Fish Eye effect. This saved me many headaches when using the Witcher Senses. Holding down L1 triggers the Quick Select menu. 
Here players can alter their equipped sign or special weapon like crossbows, bombs, or auxiliary items. Pressing R1 uses the currently equipped special slot. For buttons, triangle is used for strong attacks, X is used for mounting roach, initiating conversations, gathering herbs, and can be held down to run. In combat, X is used for roll dodges that evade further and consume stamina. Circle is used for jumping, and in combat, triggers quick dodge. Square is used for fast sword strikes that combo more easily, but do less damage. In terms of critiques I have for the controls, to start, I would say there isn't much customizability. The game also automatically sheaths and unsheaths your sword at the proper times, so having D-pad left and right assigned to this felt like an admission that this feature could be buggy. I think these buttons would have been better mapped to additional fast consumable slots while removing the ability to consume things from the in-game menu. On that topic, it seemed odd to me that Geralt is limited to two items, as using items via the shortcut menu is more difficult than simply freezing time by opening the in-game menu and consuming potions there. I think a better approach would be to force players to only use what they have equipped but making equipping more items, potions, etc. easy. Apart from that, I thought the controls worked well, especially the multi-use options for different scenarios, and how more features were unlocked by holding down buttons in certain situations. The audio in The Witcher 3 is impressive. There is a variety of thematic music for different areas of the world, and unique tracks for different activities like Gwent and Combat. All of the songs fit well and are pretty catchy. The voice acting is also well done, especially given the large number of characters that have large and small speaking roles. Geralt's gravelly voice in particular stands out with an irreverent quality that effectively delivers his trademark deadpan humor. Done celebrating. Other predominant characters like Yennefer, Triss, and even the crones give strong accompanying performances. The visuals are a different story. As mentioned before, even accounting for the age of the game, the animation quality is average. To compound this, there are some UI related issues that were bothersome. Some of these are already covered in the menu section, yet some additional items include 1. Once a crate or chest has been opened, it should no longer glow yellow when viewed through Witcher senses even if the player doesn't elect to take everything from the box. 2. There is no indicator I'm aware of that shows whether or not someone is a new NPC. This means that I might have to check a traveling merchant's inventory multiple times to ensure there aren't quest items, and is particularly annoying when trying to remember whether I've already won someone's Gwent card. 3. If it is early or late, icons for NPCs won't display. While there is logic to this, it can mislead players into thinking a new town or city they come across doesn't have NPCs to interact with. To summarize, I found that in many cases, actions players do frequently could be better optimized. This, combined with a limited quality of graphics and some jerkiness to dodge animations in combat, left me wanting more from the game's visuals. Length and replay value is another category in which The Witcher 3 excels. Despite having already played the game and skipping a number of side quests and points of interest, my playthrough still reached 87 hours. While my obsession with Gwent likely accounted for some of this, players can expect plenty of bang for their buck when it comes to purchasing this game. While all story-heavy single-player games have a limit on replay value, The Witcher 3 has more than most. In addition to the standard New Game Plus option, there is enough complexity and customizability in the skill trees that builds can focus on signs instead of alchemy, or light armor instead of heavy. The other big difference between The Witcher 3 and similar titles is that due to the variety of in-game outcomes, different playthroughs can yield very different results. For example, perhaps in one playthrough you want to support Nilfgaard and pursue Yennefer, while in another, assist Redania and court Triss. There are many large decision points and all kinds of mixing and matching that yield unique conclusions. Finally, 
there are two purchasable expansion packs that to their credit seem to offer a considerable amount of content for the extra price tag. After replaying The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, it is clear why it is considered one of the best games of all time. The primary feature is a story that is not only well told, but that is unapologetic in its mature themes, well voice acted, gives players near limitless personal freedom, and has one of the most complex sequences of variable outcomes. All of these elements put together make the choices players make matter and help produce a deeply captivating game. Add to this an impressive spread of engaging supplemental activities like Gwent, Witcher contracts, treasure hunts, and side quest arcs that are better than other games' main stories, and the result is countless hours of quality entertainment. While there are some areas to improve, including the graphics, menus, and certain suboptimal UI elements, there aren't any unforgivable issues with the game. In fact, of all the games that could be improved with simple updates in PS5 graphics, The Witcher 3 is near the top of the list. Given the age of the game, and having assessed all of the relevant areas, I'm giving The Witcher 3 an ERG score of 93. More importantly, having achieved an ERG score exceeding 90, The Witcher 3 is the first ever ERG certified banger. Do let me know what you think in the comments below, and feel free to recommend the next game deserving an ERG rating. Last but not least, do please like and subscribe if you found this review enjoyable and would like to support me creating additional content. Thank you all so much, and I hope to see you again soon.